15 years ago, on October 27th, 2005, my doctor in Washington, D.C. called me with the results of the blood work I'd had done the previous week during my annual checkup. I have bad news on the HIV test, he told me. I don't think I heard anything else after that. It was the biggest before and after moment of my life, that's for sure. By then, I had been reporting on HIV AIDS as a journalist for 20 years as an HIV negative gay man in Washington, DC. I had interviewed hundreds of men and women about their experiences of living with HIV, of losing loved ones to the virus, of advocating for resources and research related to the virus. I had even been the only American reporter who got to follow along with Princess Diana through Grandma's house, a home in Washington for children with HIV. But all the stories I had written over the years were their stories. They were other people's stories. Suddenly I had to learn how to tell my story and I had to figure out what exactly that meant. What was the story that I wanted to tell? How would I tell it? Who would be the hero of my story? Would it be a story of how cruel and capricious life is? Would it be a story about a man who is powerless in the hands of fate? Would I paint myself as one more gay man acting out on the trauma of his life, how would I tell my story? Well, one thing I knew for sure is that after two decades of reporting and interviews, I knew a lot about AIDS history. I knew the names of a lot of the people who made that history because many of them I had interviewed and written about. I looked back at the first gay men diagnosed with AIDS in the early 1980s. Men like Bobby Campbell. Bobby was a nurse in San Francisco at the time the epidemic began. The first AIDS educational posters ever were made with snapshots of the Kaposi's sarcoma lesions on Bobby's feet. In June of 1983, Bobby Campbell led a group of gay men with AIDS, 12 men, met together in a hotel hospitality suite in Denver during the second National Forum on AIDS that was held in conjunction with what was then the annual National uh, Gay and Lesbian Health Conference. It's hard to overstate how courageous it was for these men from San Francisco and New York to be public about having AIDS at a time when America was terrified about what was known at first as the gay cancer. Stigma was rampant. Even some other gay men shunned those with the illness of a, as a way of trying to shut out the terrifying growing health crisis that was beginning to kill tens of thousands of gay men and others. These men from New York and San Francisco understood the importance and power of words and language after being on the receiving end as gay men of insults, slurs, and even medical terminology used to dehumanize them and make them someone other for being different. They understood these things because as open, proud gay men, they had had to reject the stigma and the shame others told them they were supposed to feel because they were gay. They had had to seize control of the story of their lives. They had had to learn to define themselves for themselves to their own satisfaction. They had to find words and language to use, to tell their stories. They understood that like the banner they brought from San Francisco to the conference in Denver, 
that they were fighting for their lives, that the words and language they needed was powerful, that it needed to empower them. This, this group of men drafted what was called the Denver Principles, which was essentially a, a sort of constitution to govern the interactions of people with AIDS and their medical care providers. The, there were a series of rights and recommendations that would really stake out the territory, the terms and conditions by which these people with this terrifying, highly stigmatized new illness wanted to be known. We condemn attempts to label us as victims, the men wrote in the Denver Principles Preamble, a term that implies defeat, and we are only occasionally patients, a term that implies passivity, helplessness, and dependence upon the care of others. We are people with AIDS, they said very boldly. They knew that no one should ever be reduced or defined by a medical diagnosis. They knew that their personhood, their humanity, was the thing that should define them, not their condition. They knew that AIDS was something they had. It wasn't who they are. These brave men, these courageous pioneers fighting to survive a terrifying, deadly illness before there was any effective treatment, while they were also fighting for their dignity and independence. These men are my role models. From the beginning of my personal journey with HIV 15 years ago, I've insisted that I would not be defined by HIV. I know how incredibly fortunate I am because I've seen the other side, to have been diagnosed with HIV at a time when there is effective treatment that allows me to keep the virus at an undetectable level and essentially to go about my life as, as I choose. It means I don't have to devote huge amounts of my time and energy to searching for some kind of treatment as those men and other people with AIDS in the early years had to do. It means I don't live with the dread and terror that a cold could potentially be life-threatening pneumocystis pneumonia, or that a spot that shows up on my skin could be Kaposi's sarcoma, one of the earliest warning signs back then of AIDS. It also means that I'm deeply grateful to those who went before me, including those men in Denver in 1983. Their honesty and gay pride and sense of personal power changed the world. In a 1992 commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine titled AIDS, Activism, and the Politics of Health, Dr. Robert Wachter, who is the chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, said, because AIDS activists have demonstrated the degree of influence that a well-organized, highly motivated active advocacy group can have, we can be certain that the empowerment of patients will be a major part of the American social landscape of the 90s and well beyond, I would add. Those early advocates changed the face of medicine and medical research by demanding to be equal partners in decisions made about their own care, to have an active voice in researching new medical treatments at the National Institutes of Health. They were patient advocates before we had the term patient advocate. They also changed my life they and the medications developed with input from the people who would eventually use them made it possible for me to say, HIV is something I have. 
It's not who I am. They made it possible for me to say, I have HIV. I am John. I am not a victim. I am the hero of my story. And I tell it as a tale of surviving and thriving in spite of all the challenges thrown at me, including HIV. Words and language matter. How we tell our story, how we frame our experiences, especially the challenging ones, makes all the difference in whether we tell our story as a heroic tale or as a tale of woe. Words and language really matter.